and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Biohazard Games. The t the people br the people bringing back the vaunted blue planet in the form of recontact. The one the one and only Jeff Barber. How are you doing? How are you doing tonight, man? Pretty good, and I've never been introduced as the one and only, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, well you don't well you don't have any you don't have any clones lying about, do you? Not that I'm aware of, but I also don't get introduced that often, so maybe that's the reason. Um, I Thank you for that, having me. Yep, I just hope that this doesn't cause a bad influence and you end up going to Gen Con hiring a personal herald. Uh, no, but I, I wasn't thinking I would, but maybe I will now. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> but it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. And I know that this, I know that this is reaching way far back, but... <laughs> Thanks. Walk me... <laughs> Look, look, look! I know that there's usually some remark about how long about how long back I'm re I'm reaching with this question, even even with even with people who are oh, who are the OGest of OGs in the hobby. Mm. So, so walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Um. Well, I was the weird kid in homeroom. Uh, in my freshman year in high school, mm -hmm. I had just just moved from rural Alaska, believe it or not, to um, Boston, and it was a big big transition. I didn't know anybody. Um, the other weird kid in the class found me, and we started talking about random things. And he kept telling me about this cool game that he wanted to play, uh, and that I should come play it with him sometime. And Looking for new friends, I finally relented, and we went to his place and played my first session of Dungeons and Dragons. Came to find out later that it was really like a homebrew thing that he'd created, um, picking some rules here and there from the book. But I didn't know and didn't care. I was hooked, um, and uh, pretty avid player for the next couple of years. And then I fell out of it and didn't really start again till I was just about to leave college, um, graduate from college, and. Friend said, "Hey, come over and play a role-playing game." And um, it was actually Mech Warrior, I think. And I had a, got hooked a second time and stuck with it. Now, with some with something like Blue Planet, which has been which has been described as um, as a as a more as in some in some forms a more aquatic Wild West. <laughs> And yeah, that's, that's one of the tamer um, comparisons I've I've seen over the years. Um, what 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 was the inspiration for it? Because especially on the on the Kickstarter page for the for the newest edition, Recontact, you list a bunch of things that it's de that's definitely similar to, but Blue Planet kind of mm. predates a lot of the things that um, were listed. Yeah, it does. Um, I. The inspiration, it's less a dramatic story than it might otherwise seem. Uh, a lot of the game products I've worked on have been sort of born of a moment of inspiration. Mm -hmm. The last game I wrote, Upwind, was exactly that. Um, a particular image that I, a well, place I was actually, and a, and a view from that place that kind of inspired it. Um, but with Blue Planet, it was kind of um, a, a boring origin. I had been working with another game company, uh, Biohazard Game, or well, sorry, uh, Pagan Publishing, and mm -hmm. wasn't any longer. And in the '90s, it seemed like the best entree into the industry when you were on your own was to create a game. So I said, "Okay, I'm going to create a game. What kind of game can I create?" And I figured it needed to be something that I could write sensically about because um, you know I, I I didn't want the hurdle of research to be um, the thing that slowed us down. I loved science fiction. Uh, it was my first first kind of uh, love over fantasy or, or other game genres, and 
And so I said, okay, I'm going to do a science fiction game. And since I'm a marine ecologist, how about we do something with marine ecology? And um, I had been working on another game idea for Pagan about a lost colony on Mars that was very much uh, Cthulhu-esque. Um, but I had lost colonies on the brain. And uh, I was actually playing through one of the only PC video games I'd, I'd ever played in those early days called Sub War 2050. Mm-hmm. And it was about driving these little fighter subs around on the oceans of Earth, like protecting underwater bases from other fighter subs. And uh, those, those four things kind of combined into this idea for Blue Planet that sort of got built brick by brick rather than by a singular inspiration. Um, and, and so that's kind of how the, the base idea came about. Now, in that in that first edition, unle- now keep now um, keep in mind I may end up getting I may end up getting part of this wrong because it has been it has been a while since I've cracked open the books. But yeah. in that first edition, you were using a per- a uh, percentile system, and given how you mentioned that you wanted to go with something where research wouldn't um, drag down the creation process, was it for a similar reason that you ended up going with that kind of system? at first um no i so just coming out of grad school uh, a scientist by training um i i was really into simulationist games i mean it was the 90s right and i thought the the more realistic you could make the characters the more uh refined or granular i guess you could make the less granular you could make the um, mechanics the more simulationist it would be uh and a percentile system seems to be the way to go i'd played a lot of call of cthulhu of course and so a lot of the just mechanical influences were that it seemed an easy system to grok you know percentiles everyone kind of understands what that mm-hmm. means and so i didn't really put any more thought into it than that i just started putting it together and i'll be honest the focus for me at the time was the world building not really the mechanics and you know the system works but it's certainly, I wouldn't want to do it, use it now, certainly. Um, and definitely is, would, would feel very old school to anybody that tried to sort through it now. Mm-hmm. Well, then, then again, um, I, whenever, whenever I think, whenever I think of that trend of, of trying to go, of trying to go full granular, I end up thinking of, um, of the nightmare that was Phoenix Command and how, the only time I'm running that again is if I'm getting is if I'm getting paid handsomely to do it. <laughs> right, right. Um, a lot of people always use that as the quintessential example, but I'm really curious how many people have ever actually played. I know I haven't. I ha- I have pl- I have played a few sessions technically. I didn't. I never ran Phoenix Command itself. What I did run is the Aliens Adventure game, which uses the same rule set. Mm. And um, I found. I found it. To, I found it to be neat. I found it to be um, needlessly, needlessly um, crunchy at times. Yeah. At times, and th- and I'm somebody who can handle, um, who can handle Rollmaster um, in my sleep. So I'm not. I'm That's not a testing aver- it. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not aver- I'm not averse to crunchiness. I I can handle Rollmaster. I can handle Hero System. Um, I can, I. Even though, even though um, Hero System isn't really all that crunchy, it's just the character creation where all the um, crunch comes in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can and I can handle having sixteen pounds of D sixes from all my years with Shadowrun. So it was it was it was more in the it was more in the sense of much like um, a lot of the stuff that was coming out of Fantasy Games Unlimited. Um, putting emphasis on details that didn't actually matter sure um or i don't know if i don't know if i just had bad if i just had bad luck at the time but i it seemed in a lot of games in the 90s there was this trend to see how many skill how big can we make a skill list yeah (laughs) ours was pretty ours was pretty big um um uh, the reason I'm not slagging first edition Blue Planet for that specifically is, it would be unfair of me to do that because that was a thing around around that time. Um, yeah, no, it was it was definitely a 
uh, a fashion, um, um, uh, something of its time, mm-hmm. um, but in a in a kind of circular way, we're back to that with the new edition, and only that we don't technically have skills; we have skill sets, and there's essentially an infinity of them uh, because they are player generated for their specific character. Mm-hmm. So it makes it simultaneously more simplistic, but also more robust. But, and it's working out pretty well. But shif- shifting from that original first edition to 2.0, um, mm-hmm. you dropped the um, percentile system for what's been what's been known ever since as the um, D10 pool based synergy system. Um, yep. What pro- a little less swingy. The ch- what prompted the change? Well, my partner, uh, Greg Benage, um, who I should shout out, Blue Planet would never have really existed without without his input, or at least in the in the quality form that it took. Um, he created uh, most of the mechanics for second edition. Uh, and so he was a much more accomplished game designer and, of course, didn't want it to be as swingy. Um, so it was... Uh, he addressed that with the pool system over the percentile system. Mm-hmm. And when it came when it came, when it came to when it came to that that sort of pool system was that was that just was that just one of, se- of several that were suggested back and forth to work around the swinginess problem? Um, I don't know that. I mean, I didn't really participate in the development of the second edition mechanics. I was sort of backing out of game design at the time. Uh, and Greg had gone on to work with fantasy flight. Uh, they had, they had wanted to license blue planet from us and make a second edition. And, and so I was, you know, I guess at best a consultant on the project. Um, but most of, since most of it was the mechanics and Greg was doing it, um, I did some play testing, but that was about it. I don't remember long discussions about, um, the dice choices to make. Mm-hmm. And that of course that of course br- that of course brings us to um to this new to this new um addition to addition to the lineage with um recontact. Now with re with recontact you've um you've uh, I believe you've outright stated that this is a full on third edition of Blue Planet. This is not a a director's cut or a cleaned up version of 2.0. This is um, start. This is starting fresh with it with a more um, modern game design approach. Uh, yes, I mean I say yes. I think a, a casual observer will not really notice the similarities or or the you know the pieces that um, the third edition is inheriting. Mm-hmm. But someone who's well versed in second edition will see sort of spiritual descendants of a, of a few of the ideas that um, either we liked but needed better implementation or that were just particularly efficacious and we wanted to keep. Um, for people who know second edition, they'll, they'll um, know that there are lots of skills and lots of attributes um, and that there was this thing called aptitudes. Well, in the new edition, we have far fewer attributes, though the four groupings from second edition. All right. Now, speaking of that, what were some, when you looked back at second edition when you were developing Recontact, what were some, what were some of the things that fall into that category of you liked it, but needed bet, but it needed better implementation? Still psyche. So the aptitudes idea, um, the, there was a, a secondary thing that needed to be considered when rolling a, a, a test. You had to get your attribute and your skill, but you also had to, what aptitude did you have for that collection of skills? And that determined the number of 3D10 that you rolled. Mm-hmm. So there were sort of three parts to that decision. Um, we have built that into the skill sets now. Uh, so instead of skills, you have skill sets, and each skill set has a uh, general core and specialty, and that's what determines the number of dice you roll. But it's built into the character sheet, and it's intuitive in a way that it wasn't in in Blue Planet. And because the skills themselves are gone and replaced by these generalized skill sets, um, that decision point is much simpler. It's just attribute plus skill set number roll equal to or under. Yeah. 
Um, and within within that system, within that system, because I did, because I've looked at the I've looked at the skill set approach, and it is very much um, player directed. Ah, with yeah. it, with with its set with its setup. Mm -hmm. Um, when you were playtesting that, was there a bit of a learning experience from players who are more used to a defined list of skills? Um, maybe. Uh, I think if it is new to somebody, it it is novel, but extremely intuitive to pick up. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think in some ways easier than a traditional skill system because there's less sort of hemming and hawing over which skill to use and having to have a familiar. And training and occupation that make them good at a range of things. Mm -hmm. And a given skill set example might be uh, a biologist. And that biologist might have specialized, have, have, have a core specialization in, uh, might have been trained generally as a biologist, might have also received more, more uh, focused training on uh, working in a laboratory and maybe a specialist in genetics. So the skill set reads across your page as field biologist, um, lab technician, genetic specialist. And each one of those categories it, it also corresponds with the number of dice you roll. So if you're going to do anything related to be a biologist, maybe it's doing observations in the field, maybe it's operating a particular piece of machinery, uh, like a like a um, uh, some sort of sampling equipment, you'd roll one die. Mm -hmm. um, for a lab technician, you are working in a laboratory, you're doing some kind of assay, maybe you're operating a computer, maybe some sort of... Um, photographic equipment, uh, you'd roll two dice. And then for a geneticist, anything to do with genetics, whether it's genetic engineering or understanding uh, gen genetic mutations that you've encountered or how to use genetic modification tools or, or biomods, and figure out how many points you're going to spend on those skills and how much you should know computer use versus lab equipment use versus orientation because or orienteering because you know you're a field biologist and you're hiking through the jungle um it just does it, it streamlines everything and makes it easier to not only know what uh, skill set you're going to test on but also it really does a great job of describing who your character is in a way that Having um, you know a four in a skill versus a six in a skill doesn't really differentiate your character in a descriptive sense, mm -hmm. um, and so it's turning out to be quite intuitive for players, very versatile for game masters, and a great way to create characters that really feel like they are people uh, and not just a collection of uh, skill skill numbers. Oh, all right, now. When it comes now, um, I can see, when it comes to the way skill sets are written, I could see some people um, looking at them somewhat analogous to aspects in Fate. Yeah, um, it's a great way to look at them. And some whenever whenever you have these sort of descriptor based um, setups, something that I'm all that I'm always I'm always considering is the dividing line between. Between the different between the different types and the dividing line between what is a good example or what's one where the GM might say you might want to you might want to rethink that. Um, with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, what what would be the what would be um, the dividing line about what um, you would advise your players to shoot for in terms of what's going to count as general, what's going to count as core, and what's going to count as um, specialty, respectively. where the game master helps the players make their characters. Um, I generally, when I'm making skill sets for the game, I'll start with the core, um, usually, and I'll think, what's, what's a more generalized version of this, or what is another area of expertise that includes this? And then I'll think, okay, 
on the other side, what is a, a part of this core that I want my character to be specialized in. And that makes it a little easier to craft them because you're kind of looking to the left and the right, you know, going more general, going uh, more focused. But you don't have to. You can start with the most focused thing way back, whatever is comfortable, and I use a variety of them. I do give up some pieces of advice. Um, when you make them, you're going to probably end up tweaking them a little bit after the first session or two. Um, another piece of advice is don't try, try to keep them separate, right? You don't want one skill set that covers, um, say, biological sciences and then another skill set that covers genetic sciences because you've only got, um, depending upon the, the level of the campaign, you've only got um, five or seven skill sets. So you don't have a whole lot um, of room to have two of them overlapping dramatically. So you want to make sure that you try and keep them as separate as possible. Same thing with the general core and specialty distinction. You want to make sure that those feel different enough that you're not just going to use one of them for all of the tests. And it takes some tweaking and some getting used to. Um, Upwind itself, the game I wrote last, was very narrative and had a somewhat similar, slightly more poetic um, approach to character abilities. Um, but I got a lot of practice there, and so it's kind of second nature to me. Mm -hmm. So it does it, it does take a little more you know time working with it for most people to kind of get it. But once they do, it's no problem. I'll give you an example. I uh, I'm a teacher by day job, and I work at a boarding school. And over the course of COVID, of course, we've had to do a lot of different activities with our boarders that that don't involve going off campus just because we've been bottled up pretty well. And so I I uh, gotten them into analog gaming a lot more. Um, and we've been playing a Blue Planet campaign. And most of these kids had never made a character before. And there were eight of them. And in two hours, we went from blank character sheets to finished characters and, and a uh, session zero uh, campaign sort of outline. Uh, they all had finished characters. They all understood. They all created interesting uh, descriptive skill sets, effective skill sets, and had eight very different, very interesting characters. And I was really pleased with that. It was the first time we'd actually used the step-by-step -step character creation process, and I was very happy with the way it turned out. Mm -hmm. Now, one of, the, one of the things that Blue, that Blue Planet has had a degree of infamy for is how... Is how how lethal the combat system can be. Um, uh, that's that's fair, and it hasn't really changed much. Now, which uh, which give, given that this, given that this is meant to carry over a lot a lot of stuff from a lot of stuff from its predecessors is understandable. But for the benefit of those who who um might be might be using this as their gate as their gateway into Blue Planet. Um, how how do you go how do you go about expressing that degree of lethality? Um, the the sort of sarcastic advice is don't get shot and don't get eaten, um, because those are the two biggest threats on the planet. Um, the 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 mechanics are more robust and. And, I, and, and more along the narrative spectrum now than they were originally. But the goal was to keep them feeling realistic enough that they would support what we feel is a, is a realistic setting. We tried to make a science-based, hard science fiction setting. And so to have characters that were based on entirely um, narrativist mechanics didn't feel like a good fit. So... we are trying to keep some of the realistic aspects of being a paper person. Uh, and one of those is that guns and other very lethal dangers are dangerous. Um, and, and if you use tactics and armor and avoid getting shot, you're, you're going to be all right. There are lots of medical equipment and procedures that can save characters' lives, but they don't last long. Gunfights are usually a couple of rounds long, a couple of three rounds long. 
Um, if, if PCs get hit, they're probably going to go down pretty quickly unless they're well armored. So there's a lot of role playing around either staying out of fights or making sure that you have the advantage. And, you know, I've run hundreds of hours of, of Blue Planet at this point, maybe thousands. And um, I can only think of a, a handful of characters that have died. And most of that has been sort of a, almost like a, a, a narrative event rather than just can't win. Um, so it, it puts characters down quickly, but unless the game master is just bloodthirsty, it's unlikely that they're going to die simply because of the advanced medical technology that's available to them. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it, when it comes to um, when it comes to character when it comes to character creation, um, now obviously because of because of how open the uh, skill set system is, there there's no, there's um. There's a, there's a significant amount of more leeway than than you might have in more structured um, systems, but mm -hmm. e even with that, are you planning on putting in the core book a set of um, a set of archetypes as um, guidelines? Uh, probably not a set of archetype characters because um, there isn't really archetypes. There's no class system. There's no recommended. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of campaign you should play. Um, but we do have lots of skill sets, and there will certainly be more um, as a way to guide players through the process, for sure. We are having, for archetypes, we are including archetype campaigns, mm -hmm. because that, that's that been um, one of the only consistent criticisms of Blue Planet in the past was the setting was so big, I don't know where to start my game. Um, so we are doing, uh, something analogous to having the archetype characters, but they are archetype campaigns based on the various themes that we think are most interesting in the blue planet world. Well, let, let's get into that. Let, let's what can, into what can someone expect from some, from some of the archetype campaigns that you have planned? Um, well, the one that's in the quick start guide. And if your listeners don't, aren't aware, there's a free quick start guide on drive through RPG. It's an 80 page full color, all the rules. There's a, there's a setting introduction. There's a, a full, a fully realized adventure with pre-generated characters you can play. Um, there is an archetype example in there from um, the one that is based on my play test campaign called red sky charters. Mm -hmm. And, um, Imagine instead of a spaceship, um, imagine Firefly if it was a local freight hauling company that used a boat um, and they did, did little guiding on the side, uh, you know, hunting and, and guiding into the outback kind of thing. Um, basically odd jobs that are increasingly more dubious and potentially illegal to make ends meet. Um, so that's one example that, we, that will be in the book. Uh, but other themes that we're tracking are military thriller, corporate espionage, corporate espionage um, native uh, survival, uh, uh, scientific research. Each one of those will, and I think there's going to be there's going to be twelve of them mm -hmm. in the in the book. And each one is going to provide specific setup, setting, NPCs, uh, a little primer with with how to get them characters started in it, uh, and then a bunch of um, sort of suggestions, lead-outs for uh, plot hooks to keep the campaign going as just sort of places to jumpstart your campaigns. Mm -hmm. Now, when no. it comes to when it comes to character advancement, um, a, a very popular... A very popular approach, especially in the '90s, was the was what I've called the XP as currency approach. Instead mm. of you, instead of utilizing specific um, levels or th or thresholds or tiers or what have you, at X amount of experience, no, you'd gain experience and then um, spend it as essentially a currency. Um, is recontact going to be working on in a method? akin to that or do you have something different in mind for character advancement uh it is it is akin to um the currency well it is current uh and it's it's similar in that way to the original um way that we focus on character advancement it's not um 
I know in some games it's sort of a primary feature of the game is character advancement. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that people look forward to in a way that uh, it just isn't present in other games. And I think we probably fall into the latter category. But it is there and it is um, important and it is um, something that characters can can pursue if they want to. But you earn um, character improvement points through realizing three things about your character. Um, when you make your character, you come up with a goal, what you what your character wants to achieve. And this is sort of a major goal, not just some minor short-term goal, but it's a major goal that's broken down into some benchmarks. And then you also create a motivation for your character. Why do they want that goal? And then you create an attitude for your character. How does your character interface with the world around them, with other people, about chasing after that goal? Mm-hmm. And then as you make decisions and role play your character in ways that affect the narrative because of the attitude, motivation, and goal, you basically check boxes that give you these points and you can spend them to raise your attributes, to raise your focus attributes, to add new skill sets, that sort of thing. There's a narrative expectation that you justify it in the story you know if you're suddenly going to raise your physique there has to be a reason why you are suddenly bigger stronger tougher um you can't just suddenly pull it out of the out of thin air um but that again is just play style and um sort of table table consensus Mm -hmm. but that's what's encouraged so yeah it's a currency it's driven by the role playing those three parts of your character um and uh it can be emphasized or de-emphasized depending upon what the, the table wants to do. Yeah. Now, a couple in, a couple interesting um, motifs that motifs that I saw in the mechanics, especially on the on the narrative end, were tags and tracks. And mm-hmm. well, I may I may as well, and I would throw I would throw ties in there with it as well. Yeah, we may as we may as well um, have we may as well cross all the. Well, tease. <laughs> All the tease. Yeah. Um, you noticed. <laughs> if I'm pretty, I get the. Was it one of those cases where it where it was intentionally done that way, or or was the name or was the alliteration just something that happened by accident? It, well, I had I had tags and I had ties, and I felt like because I had the two, I had to do the third, so I came up with tracks, right. and it just turns out it happened to be tracks, so. But when it com- when it comes to when it comes to these three, I'm cu- I'm curious as to the I- where the idea came where the idea came from for the- for those approaches respectively, and what and what the intent is in um a- in actual play. Okay, as, as that's as a good that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, the intent is probably the was the first part. Um, one of the things that I wanted Blue Planet recontact one of the ways I wanted to be different than earlier versions the earlier versions were very focused on what characters could do mm-hmm. um, which was very 90s but I, a lot of modern games also focus on who characters are and we didn't have any mechanics for that and so I wanted to make sure that there was a way for us to mechanize who characters were or at least require that players had thought about it a little bit and if they wanted to, they could lean into it during play, and it would have um, effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and none of those things that I, that you mentioned, uh, tags, tracks, or ties, are unique in role in Blue Planet. I mean, they're they're stolen directly from other games in one form or another. What may, might make them a little different is that again, they are mostly player driven. You're not. We provide examples, but we're not providing exhaustive lists. Uh, again, the intention being that when you're done making your Blue Planet character, it will be different than anybody else's Blue Planet character, mm-hmm. um, which is probably my most favorite thing about the emergent nature of the of the new mechanics. But um, the, the idea is, like I said, we're essentially cribbed from a dozen other games. Uh, tags are just what they sound like. I think it might even be the same thing they call them in in uh, fate and they might even be called tags or qualities or something um but they are just things about your character that um 
can be temporary or permanent. Mm -hmm. They can be beneficial or they can be penalties. Uh, they are little descriptors um, that help define something that's going on with your character. Maybe the example I always end up using is you got a bum knee. Um, well, the bum knee gives you a minus two for anything where you have to run. Um, but having a bum knee in, in Blue Planet is telling because it's a world of really advanced medical technology and genetic engineering. So if you have money or the desire, you're, you won't have a bum knee for long. And so if your character has a bum knee, there has to be a reason for it. So now there's, there is sort of a descriptor just built in right there. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, maybe you also have a dashing smile. So you get a plus two to any kind of maneuver where you're trying to um, have a, a social interaction with somebody. Uh, so the tags can also be beneficial like that. They can be permanent, mm -hmm. like the bum knee, or they can be temporary, like you just got wounded and you're at a minus two um, for until you get medical care. Or uh, you've been frightened and you're going to be at a minus one for the next, uh, for the whole scene because you're just kind of um, shake it, uh, shaken up. They uh, can be player created. They can be imposed by the moderator. Um, but they're a tool for mechanizing descriptors that otherwise just kind of are agreed upon in the moment by the table um, in other systems or that um, you want to make sure are lasting parts of the character. Tracks are similar, I guess, in that they are ways of describing a character, but they in turn instead describe something about the character that changes over time, changes during play or maybe between sessions um, or even over campaign arcs. Uh, and they describe generally something about a character, their feelings, their emotions, their uh, connections to other other things. Um, their, uh, it might cover something like their bravery. Uh, it might cover something like their um, relationship to their employer. Uh, it might cover um, something about their dedication to a particular belief system. Mm -hmm. And based on events in the story, you go up and down on the I mean, people have seen in lots of other games, things like Call of Cthulhu with their sanity track. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we didn't want to limit ourselves to just one measurement. So a moderator might say, this game's going to be a lot about going out into the wild and we're going to be um, a company, we're going to be security for a, a scientific expedition and we're going to be encountering lots of crazy wildlife. So there's going to be lots of hair raising, adrenaline pounding moments. So maybe you have an adrenaline scale or maybe you have a, a bravery scale. Or maybe you um, are an agent and you work for some organization and you have a track that says that you're all, all in with the organization, you're a dedicated disciple. Or maybe at the other end of the track, it says that, screw this, these people are criminals and I don't want to work here anymore. Um, but during course of play, you move up and down in that track based on circumstances and you gain benefits or earn penalties based on how those circumstances relate to the track. The same level in the track may be a bonus or a penalty depending upon those circumstances. For example, you have a track that connects you to a, uh, a friend. Let's say you um, love that friend and you do anything for them and now they've been kidnapped. Well, you're going to maybe get a bonus when you do something dangerous to try and save them because you're so dedicated to them. Or conversely, maybe you're so afraid that they are going to get hurt that it's just a penalty because you don't want to cause them any harm by acting rashly. So again, it's it's something that is usually customized by the moderator for, for their campaign mm -hmm. and by the players for their particular character concepts. Yeah. And you can have two, three, four of them even um, per character. And they can come up during the game. Maybe events in the game create a new track for everybody. Suddenly you have a nemesis, and now you have a relationship with that nemesis mm -hmm. that is tracked you know, they're hunting you down, and are you how close are you to being hunted? That kind of thing. Now, the way you describe tracks and the way you describe ties, I could see a Venn diagram forming between the two of them. So I'm curious where the dividing line, where, where, um, the, where something would lean more towards a track and something would lean more towards a tie. That's an insightful question. Um, I think of tracks as things that change 
uh, back and forth over time. Um, and I think of ties as things that are, are permanent until they're broken. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they may be a Venn diagram. You could have a track with, uh, just for clarity, tracks are ways of describing your relationship with other people and organization. So for example, let's say you have a spouse um, and you uh, need to provide emotional and financial support to that spouse. That's mm-hmm. the obligation part. So every, every tie is identified with a name, and there the, the relationship is described, and then the obligation to that relationship is described. So um, if it's a spouse, um, then that defines who they are, and then the obligation is what you have to do to maintain that relationship in, in a healthy way. Um, or in whatever way you define it as, because your relationship could be with an enemy, and maybe it's a rivalry that you're maintaining, and it and it could be an entirely different form to to what is needed to maintain it. But I can also see someone who really wants to make that relationship a big part of their character, also having a track. So maybe you have an estranged spouse as a track, mm-hmm. and or sorry, as a tie. And your obligation to them is uh, financial support um, with the occasional emotional support or, or whatever. Maybe you share children and now you've got to co-parent and maybe that's one of your obligations with them. I can also, in that case, imagine a track where you are tracking your relationship with them. Is it positive in this moment? Is it, is it negative in this moment? And how does that affect your character's actions? Mm-hmm. So they can very much be a Venn diagram. Um, Generally, they are addressing different parts of the character, however, things that change versus things that are um, uh, important and permanent. Important things that change versus important things that are um, kind of permanent. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to the when it comes to when it comes to um, maneuvers, um. With the the thing that the thing that I note that I noticed is that with each diff, each different type, um, you have a tr- you have a trinity of um, attack and de- of attack and defense with the with the approaches. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then not necessarily attacks, right? I mean, there are money maneuvers that have nothing to do with with fighting. Yeah, I'm so, just I'm just using I'm just using attack and defense as a shorthand. Sure, sure. I just want to make it clear for anybody listening. But within within that within that particular set setup, um, was it all was it always the intention to make to make it so that maneuvers were a um, were a conte- were a contested affair from the from the start, or were there attempts to try and make um, static make more static attempts early on in development? Um, the maneuvers really just overlap. With- opposed tests in general and post test came first mm-hmm. and and all the things that you'll see described as maneuvers just generally are opposed tests either opposed by another character or an npc or um, some feature of the environment um so i guess i, I can't say it was an intention it sort of it is the terminologies are sort of evolved that way mm-hmm. and the the fact that the maneuvers are um, sort of the, the, the overlap with it is, is I think, just coincidental. All right. All right. All right. I could, I could, certainly, um, I could certainly see that. Now, the reason that there's – the reason we define three approaches, I mean, the whole idea behind maneuver to uh, sort of restrict or overly define people's approaches to things, in fact, is just the opposite. Um, it's been my experience that oftentimes people struggle – knowing what to do in certain circumstances. Uh, and so by providing the manu- three maneuvers in sort of each general category um, or in any potential category, because game masters, again, um, are encouraged to create maneuvers that their table likes to use. Um, the idea is that like a Blades in the Dark character sheet, for example, that kind of tells you what you need to use whenever you're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Just by looking at your character sheet, we had, my intention with the maneuvers was the same thing. You look at the character sheet, 
and get some inspiration on what you could try to do in a given circumstance. If you're in a vehicle chase, well, here's three options that kind of cover everything you might want to do. Um, which which one of these options best fits either what you want to try or your character's skill set? Pick one, uh, and then and then it tells the moderator immediately kind of opposition to that maneuver there might be, um, and lets them um, test accordingly. So it it really uh, it seems like it might be something that adds complication, but in practice, it's actually intended to remove that complication and just make the choices feel more natural and descriptive um, rather than sort of uh, a challenge that slows down the decision making. Now, now one of the one of the one major of the, things that's the major br- thing. that's brought up in the um, qu- in the quick start is the rule of two. Um, mm. mm-hmm. And it's br- it's brought up it's brought up in both maneuvers and in ju- and in um and in ge- and in the general rules as well. Um, how did the rule of how did the rule of two come about? Uh, through playtesting, really. Um, I could cut all the references to <clears throat> the rule of two out of the out of the um, text, and all of the modifiers you need would still be described in their various sections. But the more I played, and the more um, I wrote. More, I realized that the most common modifier was a minus two or a plus two, mm-hmm. and even though sometimes it's higher or lower, in the end you're usually adding one or two modifiers together anyway, and so it all kind of comes out in the wash. And so I realized it was really because Blue Planet is intended to be heavily modified by the moderator because the circumstances in the world are varied, and in an attempt to be realistic, we wanted there to be a sense that things are always um, specific and different. Um, It was suddenly apparent that it was just easy to say, okay, what are the benefits to this situation? Well, I got an elevated position and they don't know I'm here, so surprise and it's short range and blah, blah, blah. So each of those are plus two. I'm looking at a plus eight. And then uh, what are the negatives of this situation? Well, the target is moving. They're armored and they got cover and um, I didn't realize that there are two of them. So now I'm each one of those things is a minus two and now I'm down to a plus two. So you just add the benefits, subtract the negatives, and that's the modifier to your test. Mm. And in play, it's super easy. Um, and it, it's kind of fun to kind of, especially in a dramatic moment, to have the players kind of think through what they're doing and give you all the things trying to make themselves have an advantage and then you can describe how the nefarious villain is doing all these other things to create a disadvantage and um so far it's been sort of a very simple and elegant way to make things feel diverse and challenging um, and get people to really describe what they're up to uh, and so i'm i'm pretty happy to lean into it all right now when it comes now when it comes to the da- when it comes to the damage set damage setup, um, in the I do rem- I do remember way way in the early end end of things you had um you had different tiers of results when it came to weapons and in this case you still kind of have it it's more of the amount the amount of successes on the damage roll determine how serious the wound is if right. the, if there if there is one at all they may they may just get lu- they may just get lucky um. Was that was that just a net? Was that just part of a natural shift shifting into a more abstract wound based approach? Uh, well, that that shifting happened between first and second edition, mm-hmm. and the one thing that is unchanged from second to third is the damage mechanic. Um, I've always felt it was really elegant. I can't take any credit for it. It was my partner Greg um, that designed it, um, but it. I feel it does a lot of nuance very simply uh, and it maintains the realistic threat of violence or that violence has to to characters Um, and and so uh, yes it was intentional um, but it's more a carryover um, from second edition a direct carryover from second edition than Mm -hmm. tend to to do anything different um, from second edition and 
when it com when it comes to when it comes to um count when it comes to combat and, and how and how encounters are managed, um, would it be fair of me to say that a game like Blue Planet is going to benefit more from theater of the mind than stri than a more strict grid or hex based affair? Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could do it on a on a hex grid if you want. I mean, there are certainly with second edition you could first edition you absolutely could because I did it many times. Second edition you could also because there were range measurements and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Third edition a little little more challenging. A game master that wants to can like weapons no longer have. They used to have a short, medium, and long range. I think point blank range um now they just have one number which is effective range and you modify from that number um so people who don't really care about that kind of thing can just play with that one number oh you can hit nope you can't hit too far away or if you want you can modify to shorter ranges or longer ranges um using the rule of two essentially um but uh also based on the particular the particular weapon um so you could use that effective range to do a grid combat. Um, but uh, like I said, combat tends to be pretty lethal and not last very long. So by the time you've got your battle mat out and, you, and you're on round three, um, half the characters are going to be down, PCs or NPCs, depending. Um, and so often, I mean, I generally just play it in in uh, theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, when it getting when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the death rate with ca with characters, would it be would it also be fair to say that even with all the advanced tech in a world like Blue Planet, um, healing is not is not re is not readily access it's accessible but not readily accessible to the point where nobody's going to be um, throwing about nanites <laughs> to, tr yeah. try and, to try and quickly heal or if they do have them that's again that's going to be a arm and a leg cost right well humans don't have nanites um that's a, a central part of the game um but they do have some advanced technologies that make it easier in fact there's a uh, something called a i can't remember what it's called a cryo oxygenator mm -hmm. which you know is a very expensive piece of medical equipment that's carried by military units and uh, if someone takes a traumatic injury, um, even if they technically die, you just clamp this thing on their head. It basically replaces their blood with an artificial uh, serum and oxygenates their brain, um, refrigerates them down, and essentially keeps their brain potentially viable for um, a number of days, uh, even potentially weeks, mm -hmm. um, even though their body may die. And then with the genetic engineering that's available, place the body parts um, and potentially um, salvage the, the, the person. Um, so I mean, that, that isn't a ridiculous example, but is the kind of thing that's available. Basically, the rule is if you can get them to medical care, survive because of the technology that's available, particularly the... I mean, shock is what kills a lot of people, blood loss. If you can replace those, stop one and replace the other, you're probably going to survive. And those are things that are well within the technology of, of Blue Planet. So, you know, recovering, you might not be hearty and hale the next day and off on your next adventure. But the truth is, I mean, in most adventures, when there's that kind of traumatic damage to a character, time passes between that, that session and the next one anyway, usually. And so healing, if you don't want to be really specific about it, could certainly be hand-waved and assumptions can be made about how fast it happens. Now, something something else that I did no, that I did notice to add to, to add to that um, lethal nature is the is the lack of a extra effort mechanic in the traditional approach. The closest that I was able to find was strain, and even and even that's a bit of a stretch. Um, and. For the sake for the sake of simplicity, what I refer to when I'm talking about extra effort systems, just to give examples from other games, um, Edge in Shadowrun, Willpower in World of Darkness, um, Void Points in Legend of the Five Rings. That's that's the kind of thing that I'm referring to with that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, 
we consciously didn't want some sort of um, abstract currency that could be spent on things because, again, we're trying to create characters that feel like real people in a real hard science fiction world. And having moxie or uh, fate points that gives a, a sense of, of the unreal. So we did intentionally um, include strain as the, the way for characters, players to adjust the odds or have another bite at the apple if they wanted to make um, another test, another roll. Uh, so that's the exact intention behind the new strain mechanics, and that is that is new. That is not something that existed in the previous editions. And with and within the within um, the mechan the mechanic with strain. The other th the other thing I co I couldn't help but notice is that you have the you have the pool of mental and physical strain, but you also have a value that it can presumably be um, tested against. Um, well, you're not testing it against a, the way, the way strain works is you based on your psyche, you have a certain number of, um, well, so there are four attributes, four primary attributes in the game, uh, cognition, psyche, uh, coordination and physique, uh, the number of psyche, um, the, the score that you have for your, your psyche attribute determines how many, um, mental strain points you have and the, um, score, the rank you have for your physique determines the number of uh, physical strain points you have. And there are two ways to spend those points. You can spend them in advance of a test, and at one for one, you can add them to your target number to increase the chance of rolling equal to or under that target number. Mm -hmm. So if your target number is a five and you want to spend a physical strain to lift that weight, um, it basically becomes a six. And uh, Or if you have two points and you want to spend two points, it becomes a seven. Um, it just helps you succeed. The other way they can be spent is if you fail the test, you can spend one to re-roll that same test. Mm -hmm. The gamble is if you fail again, then you have overstrained yourself and you are minus one for the associated attribute until your character has had an appropriate recovery. And that might be a night's sleep. It might be a medical care. It could be a week's vacation. Um, it just depends on the like, nature of the strain and, and the, how your table likes to play those sorts of things. All right, I gotcha. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a um, as far as a to as far as a total page count for the um, co for the core book of um, Recontact? So there's two core books: the Player's Guide and Moderator's Guide that are uh, part of the Kickstarter. And uh, each one is currently targeted for 300 pages. So it's a 600 page uh, total count. Yeah. Um, an interesting thing I noticed with the quick start, and I bring this up because even a, even a lot of games with mu with much big with much bigger names um, don't do this as much as I'd like. Um, is the fact that not only do you have bookmarks, which I think is which I think is essential, with PDFs, but you also have um, hyperlinks in the table of contents. And with the PDF version of the Player's Guide and Moderator's Guide, is that something that is going to be carried over from the quick start sure. to the full books? Uh, I, I certainly hope so. I, um, I haven't, I'll be honest, we haven't actually discussed that. So um, I, I would like to say yes, but I can't. I don't want to make a promise that ends up not being true. It's a lot easier to do with an 80-page quick start guide than it is with 600 pages of, of other books. Mm -hmm. At the very, at the very least, it'll at the very least it'll still have an index. So that's our, that's already going to be sure. one point. Sure, absolutely, um, absolutely. And I think I can imagine at least the table of contents being hyperlinked. Certainly, mm -hmm. um, but it would be great if we could do more than. That. Yeah. Some. Some. I think the 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 only two um the only two major um game lines that I can think of that do a whole lot of um hyperlinking beyond just the table of contents is Wade Dyer with the Fragged series and um the and Monty Cook games with the Cipher system. Mm -hmm. There's probably a, there's they, probably a few they also have that they also have that great little uh, sidebar system where all their stuff is referenced. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Now, when it now when it comes to when it comes when it comes one of the other, one of the things I noticed when it came to the reward tiers that I found interesting is off is offering PDF versions of the previous edition. Um. Yeah, um, that was that was intentional. Uh, obviously, I mean, crassly put, it's it's there to help encourage um, people to to back the Kickstarter because they get they get an um, immediate reward. You know, most so many Kickstarters uh, delay gratification. Right, you have to be willing to back them and wait a year to get the thing that you backed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just excited to be able to say, okay, you backed us. Thank you so much. In the meantime, here's everything we've booked, we've published for Blue Planet in the past. Um, hopefully, this will tide you over. Um, and so I'm I'm just glad to be able to offer that. Of course, I also hope that it will encourage people to back because they get more stuff and they get some stuff now. Um, but it, it's a I think it's a good use of of that past material. Now, when it comes now, when it comes, would would it also would another major reason for for that aside from the gratification is is the um is to have a, have a wide grasp on the on the fluff within within Poseidon. Sure, I mean that's that is um, it's it's funny that the term always kind of puzzles me. Fluff. Uh, I'm a world building guy. Mm -hmm guy i love the settings of a game uh, i don't even really think about the mechanics i know a lot of people buy games because they want to see new mechanics i i don't even look you generally consider the mechanics when i'm buying a new game I, do i like the setting um and so that's kind of how i make games um so for me it's it's not fluff for me it's the core of of the game and and we want I mean, that's the reason I think the Blue Planet is endured is because of its setting. So, of course, we want people to enjoy it. And um, we're, despite the fact that the new mechanics are sort of the fresh part or one of the fresh parts of third edition, mm -hmm. the majority of those 600 pages are going to be setting background um, because that's what Blue Planet is and that's what Blue Planet is known for is is its setting. Yeah, when... when for me personally, when it comes to the whole fluff versus crunch debate, which I'm only using, the, I'm only using the terms just because um, when in Rome you do as the Romans do. Right, right. Um, I more often than not find myself somewhere in somewhere in the middle. Largely, largely because what's mo what's most important to me is are the mechanics being presented compatible with the setting that's being presented. And are and do 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 they match each do they match each other when it comes to the tone that e that each is trying to go with? Like if you're if a game is supposed to be highly le highly lethal and combat is supposed to d supposed to be discouraged, do the mechanics reflect this? If it's if it's supposed to be a hack and slash, do the combat do the mechanics reflect it? Um, mm -hmm. So so when it comes to I will I will I will freely admit I will freely admit that um a good a good setting will more often than not draw draw me but I don't but I I think that fo I think that focusing solely on one or solely on the other um is um forest for the trees. Yeah, I think you're exactly right and I and I actually appreciate that perspective that um they need to match up because we've put an awful lot of thought into making sure that the new mechanics do feel complementary of the system. I'm a big fan of games where the mechanics reinforce the setting and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, I, I really get a, I mean, it's a, it's a more modern game design ethos and I, and I really appreciate that. Um, and I, so I, I strongly agree with what you're saying. The only the only downside when it comes to when it comes to this for me is that is that I can't get along with universal style games because it's like asking me to crochet with boxing gloves on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they appeal to some folks and and not others. Um, really, I think it depends on on 
mechanical tastes. If you don't care about mechanics, then universal system is probably fine. If you do care about that integration setting, it's, it's less fine. I rational um, I rationalize it by say, by saying um, universal systems like like GURPS or or Hero or or Savage Worlds are not are um not to be looked at as as games but look at them more like that blue bucket of Legos that we all had as kids. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm um, yeah, I, I can see that, um, but I think it's increasingly difficult to justify the term games for role-playing games anyway um if you're thinking in a narrow sort of there are the rules are um cogent enough to be self-regulating and and robust enough to um support all the different ways that they can be used and not break or be contradictory i think as far as role-playing games go that's a, a incredibly high order and pretty rare in the in the industry, especially um, since their entire forum threads dedicate dedicated to finding new and interesting ways to break to break the yeah. to break the set. Um, yeah, yeah. Case, case in point, the legend that is pun pun. Yeah, I don't. I I, I would love if somehow as an industry wide and and as gamers in general, role playing gamers for role playing games. Uh, role playing experiences or role playing events or role playing something. Um, I just think it would be more honest about what we're trying to do and what what the things are, um, at least for a, a vast a vast portion of games. Certainly, the less tactical ones, the more narrative ones. I would I would cert I would certainly um I would certainly uphold that, especially especially since um there's a there's a much wider variety of of approaches to to the hobby than a lot of people think. Um, the un the unfortunate part is that is at this point it's a it's akin to tr to trying to catch a baseball with your non dominant hand. Mm -hmm. So I'm left handed and I'm not and I'm not catching a baseball with my right hand no matter how much hard sure. I try. Sure. <laughs> um. Now I I I know you. I know you had set the delivery date as October 2022, but mm -hmm. when it comes to the when it comes to at the very least the digital version, because obviously the um, even if we, even if we weren't in a pandemic, the physical version is go is going to have its own set of challenges just because um, printing is a way to make everyone's life interesting. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good way to put it. What? What would what would the release window that you'd be shooting for when it comes to the digital version at the very least? Uh, yeah, again, I don't want to make any promises that we can't keep. Um, I will say that we, you know, there's that adage, pick a really generous delivery date for your Kickstarter and then add six months. Um, I had a rough experience when we did our upwind Kickstarter because um, my partner, Stuart Wick, passed away in the middle of the project. And um, it obviously meant lots of delays. Um, so in approaching this one and doing so in the midst of a pandemic, um, we did pick a generous delivery date and then did add six months, especially considering how much of the project is already done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all, almost all the words, uh, we, we've hit a lot of stretch goals. They're going to add new words. So let's back up a minute. Pre-stretch goals, 90% of the words were done. Um, post stretch goals, we've added, you know, another 40,000 words, maybe 50,000 words. So there's a, a lot still to, to be done, but that will be uh, spread amongst a number of writers. So it won't be uh, as much of a time issue. Really. I think what's going to take the time is art asset production because mm -hmm. art, art is good. Art takes time. Um, and then of course, editing and layout and then the, the physical production itself. I I think that's one of the reasons I'm glad to be able to share uh, the upwind, the, the sorry, the uh, past editions of Blue Planet uh, PDFs, so that we can kind of tide folks over. Mm. Um, but we, but I can say that as soon as we are able to distribute the PDF, uh, we will. Um, in fact, there's been a call for 
even early versions of the PDF so that folks can go hunting after typos and that sort of thing. And I would, I'd love to be able to um, utilize folks' goodwill for some of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully in the winter, I guess, of next year, um, that will be happening. We'll see. Uh, how how, appro- how appropriate a game th- a game with a, a game featuring lots and lots of water coming out coming out at the time when no when nobody can get in the water. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> um, not, unle- not unless you want to unless you want to drive over the lake like you're ice fishing around here. <laughs> well, you are from Minnesota. Don't forget, there are people who live in. I used to live in Hawaii, so you know you be in the water year round. Yeah, I I know. I've got I've. I've got I've got I've got some folks over there who will find new and inter- interesting ways to rub salt in the wound whenever it whenever I'm in the middle of the freeze. Yeah, well, they also live six thousand miles from land, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Well, the gratitude's all mine. I really appreciate the invite. I like talking about games. I like talking about Blue Planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, your support for the game and the Kickstarter is extremely valuable. So I really appreciate it. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As we well, often say you. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>